I'm happy to introduce Amy Yu, um, an assistant professor of medicine in the department of medicine in the division of hospital medicine here at university, talking about inner hospital transfers provider, uh, provide perspectives on care and coordinating challenges. Dr. Yu um, did her bachelor's on, on biological sciences and religious studies and philosophy at Stanford University. Then doctor of medicine is in Antonio, Texas, at uh, University of Texas Health Science Center. Subsequently, uh, internal medicine residency and chief residency uh, at, here at Anschutz. Um, I'm doing a master of clinical science uh, here at the uh, School of Public Health or? Uh, school, uh, graduate school. Graduate school. Um, Dr. Yu has been the recipient of many, many teaching and clinical practice awards throughout her career. Dr. Yu is a PI of a grant from the University of Colorado Division of Hospital Medicine to support proposal, identifying barriers and facilitators to providing care for inner hospital transfer patients. Dr. Yu has published many articles on topics stemming from interdisciplinary hospital transfers, discharge multidisciplinary rounds, hospitals' perceptions of medical records and experience of women in hospital leadership positions. We'd like to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you so much for that very generous introduction. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Yu. Thank you for having me today. Um, I got the whole convention. I'm going to speak about inner hospital transfers, specifically about provider perspectives on care coordination challenges. Oh, there we go. Okay, All right, I have no disclosures. <clears throat> And I don't, I'd like to start off with a patient story about Irma, whose name has been changed for this presentation. Irma is the reason why I'm so passionate about wanting to improve inner hospital transfers. I met Irma when I was a second year resident here at Colorado. Uh, I had been called in the afternoon about 3.30 p.m. by our triage saying, you have an admission. Uh, the nurse is very anxious to talk to you. They have not been able to get a hold of her. Of the provider. <coughs> so I called the nurse and said, hey, I'm Amy. I'll be taking care of the patient today. How can I help? The nurse said, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I've been trying to get a provider for the last three to four hours. I said, okay. Um, what, what is the patient? Uh, how's the patient doing? How can I help? She said, the patient's in pain and I don't know what the care plan is. I open the patient's chart try to get gather some information. I see that there's some vital signs. They look fine. But then no documentation about why the patient was transferred, and no outside hospital records that I can access through the EMR. I asked the nurse, did the patient by chance come with any records? You know, that huge stack of yeah. papers that we this always is. get? <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> nurse said, no, nothing came with the patient. So I said, all right, sounds good. We'll just uh, go ahead and uh, go to the patient room. So I head over to the patient's room, I knock on the door, I enter the room, and Irma is there, and she's curled up in a little position, just crying and moaning. Bob, her husband, jumps up from the couch, says, where have you been? Can't you see she's suffering? And you can imagine how I feel, being the provider, wanting to do the best that I could for this patient, but not having any information available. So then I, I have to ask, so... Why is Irma here at the University of Colorado Hospital? And Bob just stares at me and he says, you know, our primary care doctor in a rural town in Colorado said this is the best hospital in Colorado, but for the last four hours, my wife has not gotten any care and you guys don't even know why she's here. Later, I found out that Irma had been transferred for West Nile virus encephalitis. She had already gotten IVIG at another hospital and had been transferred to our facility to see if there was anything else we could do. Our neurology colleagues didn't have anything else to offer. So we essentially transferred her home uh, to a rehab facility, and then she died three weeks later. Mm -hmm. So this case kind of highlights, or not kind of, <laughs> highlights a lot of the frustrations and the pitfalls within inner hospital transfers that I'll go through through the rest of this uh, presentation. Oh, whoops, there we go. <laughs> Okay, so before we start, I'd just like to go over a couple of definitions, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, in interhospital transfers, I may talk about sending a sending hospital, that is the acute care hospital that sends a patient to another hospital for further care. Then we have the accepting hospital, oftentimes, such as UCH, uh, that accepts a 
patient and then have them come to their facility for care. And then this process of moving a patient from one hospital to another is the intra-hospital transfer process or IHT. Now, IHTs are actually fairly common. Um, they affect 10% of all Medicare patients, and it's something that we all experience day to day for those of, who, of us who either work in the hospital or in clinic. But interestingly enough, even though these are pretty common, transfer patients actually have higher risks. Transfer is not benign. Transfer patients have increased in hospital mortality, higher, a longer length of stay, longer lengths of ICU stay, and higher levels of cost. And this is all independent, uh, an independent uh, risk factor. In national studies, uh, even adjusting for risk factors with patient characteristics, IHT status confers uh, a two-time risk for mortality. On average, transfer patients actually stay at least three days longer compared to equivalent patients admitted through the emergency department. They have longer lengths of ICU stay, and then they also have $10,000 more of hospital costs than their counterparts admitted to the So why does this happen? This actually is a really understudied area. Um, and one thought is that it's related to the fact that we have no standardized guidelines for, or very few standardized guidelines for inter-hospital transfers. What does exist is disease-specific and for emergent situations, which I think we all are familiar with. Uh, door to needle time for acute stroke, door to balloon time for MI. But for transfers that are non-emergent, very little exists at all. So hospital system, hospitals, units, services, they're all left to their own device to come up with their own product protocols and everyone does it differently. So I'm interested in looking at this process and this is a very high level view of the inner uh, hospital transfer process, kind of starting from home on the left <coughs> to going to discharge onto the right. Um, and I'm mainly interested in this area where the decision has already been made to transfer the patient and the patient is being sent to the next hospital. I think this particular area where we're trying to prepare for the patient's arrival when they actually arrive and we admit them is the time of most vulnerability, but also the area where we can have the most impact for patients. That's where I want to study. So this is um, just a graphic of UCH, which is a really big hospital in uh, Colorado. And I'm showing this because I want to just say that UCH is actually a great place for us to study in our hospital transfers. We have a huge catchment area. Our metrics for patient outcomes are very similar to those uh, in the national data. And then furthermore, 7% of all of our admissions are in our hospital transfers. So I think this is just a great opportunity for us to not only have local impact, but national impact as well. My studies are primarily uh, qualitative studies right now. The first study that I conducted uh, was a nursing perspective study called Our Hands Are Tied uh, and Hunger Not Here. Mm -hmm. Nursing Perspectives on Inter-Hospital Transfers. So just to tell you about the objectives of, objectives of the study, they were to characterize the experience of inpatient floor nurses caring for medicine inter-hospital transfer patients and to identify challenges that they have with care coordination and solutions that they may have had. The design study was that it's a qualitative study with semi-structured interviews and focus groups. We uh, grounded our interview questions in the ARC care coordination measurement framework. And then we uh, conducted interviews from October 2019 to July 2020. This is a table of the characteristics where we had interviewed 21 nurses. 81% of them were female, which is actually uh, consistent with the representation of nursing across the United States. We uh, tried to get an even amount of patients, uh, uh, participants across day and night shifts, but that didn't quite work out. So our sample size is primarily daytime. And then uh, as I had mentioned, we had looked at primarily medicine uh, patient nurses. So the themes that came up from our study uh, were three. There was theme one, which surrounded communication during IHT. Nurses talked about challenges with information exchange during nursing handoff. They also talked about challenges with the communication structures, with the transferring uh, nurse from the other facility and also with the admitting team on arrival of the patient. Theme two is centered around preparation. Nurses talked about how they had to prepare the environment for the patient as well as prepare information. 
And then thirdly, uh, they talked about negotiating responsibility for patient care, specifically about having to assume responsibility for the patient and then resuming the care that the patient has. And we'll go into more detail with them representative for us. So for theme one, with regards to communication during IHG, for the nurses, their um, process started with a nurse handoff. And that usually happened over the phone. It was a verbal report <coughs> because EHR uh, access was inconsistent. And so they often talked about how they would talk to a nurse from another facility, get a report, but there was lack of standardization of what they were told. Um, they also didn't know if they could trust the other nurse necessarily because of different level of experience, the different level of acuity. So one nurse had mentioned, what we know about the patient is always kind of up in the air. Sometimes we get something that is very different than what we had heard, and sometimes we get exactly what we heard about. It's kind of like a guessing game until the patient arrives to see what we're actually dealing with. Furthermore, um, once, the, once the patient has arrived, nurses had mentioned that they had difficulty getting a hold of the primary team. One nurse said, it's like, okay, well, try this person. And it's just never ending call and call him and call him and call her. Furthermore, once they finally got a hold of the provider, told them what they needed, got things going, nurses also communicated that the enemy team wasn't that great about updating the nurse about the care plan or involving them. So one nurse mentioned, it's like I'm out of the loop. I don't know what's happening and I don't know what's going on. Sometimes, I have to ask the patients, so what did the doctor tell you? Oh. And it's kind of odd because the nurses and the doctors should be communicating. So theme two was environmental and informational prepare, uh, preparation for ice. <laughs> so nurses actually have to think a lot about what do they need to do before a patient arrives in the hospital. So if a patient is on oxygen, they need to make sure they have that tubing equipment. If the patient needs to slid over onto the bed, they need to get the board. All these things that they need to consider, not only for the patient's safety, but also for staff safety as well. One nurse mentioned, if you don't know that a patient is going to be on contact precautions or anything like that, how many people have been in and out of that room um, at that point, not wearing the appropriate protective gear? You wanna make sure that you're creating a safe environment for your patients in the moment, once the, the moment that they get here. Secondarily, our nurses are the first point of contact for our patients and their family. So they are often asked questions. So what for him? What's going on? So our nurses often feel like they have to be prepared. Some of the nurses say, I see patients expect us to be expecting them. And we almost seem unprepared because we don't know who the doctor is right away. We don't know what the plan is. And we don't know what the rest of the orders are. So it puts them in a very difficult position where they need to prepare for these patients, yet they are working with lack or missing information. And lastly, theme three was about negotiating responsibility and patient care during IHT. Nurses talked about how they have to assume responsibility for IHT patient care right when the patient comes to the hospital. One nurse said, we take on the responsibility for caring of the patient immediately. And while the doctor is very important, we're really the ones taking care of patients for probably the first three to four hours, depending on what the admitting team's workflow looks like. They are immediately responsible for and to the patient. Furthermore, they feel this pressure of having to resume the patient's care from the hospital, if not advance it. They talk about the first question that IHT patients have is, can I eat? Can I drink? <laughs> and then they say, oh, you're in a ton of pain, that really sucks. Here's some ice. I know you were getting morphine and fentanyl at the other hospital, but I don't have any orders. Our hands are tight until your doctor gets here. So we put them in a situation where they are immediately responsible, yet they have no agency to act on the care that they would like to provide for the patients. This is a table um, that matches our uh, the HRQ framework domains of communication, assessing needs and goals, and negotiating responsibility. For time's sake, I might just fly through this, mm -hmm. is that we have talked about difficulty with communication. Their solutions were standardizing the handoff report, not only with the content, but the timing. Some of the nurses mentioned they didn't even get report until 30 minutes after the patient had arrived to the hospital. Uh, they also talked about increasing bi-directional communication, giving them the agency to call the other hospital 
or call the providers. And having the provider team, the admitting team that signs beforehand would be really helpful. Then in terms of assisting uh, needs and goals, because of missing information, again, they also mentioned standardizing the nursing report and including them in the care plan. So something for admitting teams to think about. And with regards to negotiating responsibility, how we talked about um, how they are immediately responsible, yet they don't have the agency to act, getting the admitting team to see the patient as soon as possible and get orders in. All right, so that is the nursing study. I do have a physician and APP study that uh, we just completed and we're in the uh, preliminary analysis phase. The objective of this study is very similar <laughs> to that of the nursing one, and this is to look at physician and APP perspectives at an admitting hospital, specifically UCH. And just to let you guys know, we were looking at physicians uh, taking in uh, calls to accept transfer patients, the APPs who assign the patients to the teams once they arrive, and then the APP and physician teams that actually admitted to the inner hospital transfer patients. We were looking for care coordination, challenges, and solutions, and we also did semi-structured interviews based off of the same measurement framework, as well as the nursing study interview guide. We were able to uh, get 30 participants, and we studied them from September to December 2021. This is the demographics of those. You can see it's uh, about two thirds female, one third female. We tried to be very intentional about trying to get physician and APP equity across our um, interviews. And then we did also try to get daytime, student, and night providers that match what our demographics are made for. Okay, so challenges and solutions. They're going to look very similar. <laughs> so the challenges, and we'll go through each one one by one is that information exchange is incomplete and inaccurate. Same thing, the reports that they were getting from the outside hospital sometimes missed information. The packets that they get just have tons of, I don't know, nursing notes or medication administration times that were not helpful. So the solutions were to standardize the handoff reports and the clinical documentation content. So a lot of providers mentioned that they would love a discharge summary. Two, uh, they also talked about how communication structures for them were inaccessible, unidirectional, fragmented. They talked about needing bidirectional, transparent, and accessible communication structures that actually facilitate real-time information exchange. Next, they talked about how healthcare team members have differing care expectations. For example, patient arrives, our nurses expect our admitting team to know what's going on. I just heard about this patient. I don't know, so I need some time to understand what's going on, or I call one of my consultants and they're like, I've never heard of this patient. So I'm trying to make sure everyone is on the same page. And then lastly, it's our participants also talked about a cognitive, that the cognitive load and workload pressures are particularly high. You can imagine for the IHP patient coming in, you have to be able to synthesize what their needs are and their clinical care plan in a very short period of time with incomplete information. And if there's a clinical status change, that is very, very difficult. So our providers mentioned that one solution would be to have dedicated providers who take care of IHT patients who can dedicate and devote the time that these patients need. One, uh, one example of um, an illustrative quote is, even when IHTs are not haphazard, even when it happens exactly the way it's supposed to, there are a lot of transfers of information. Each one of those create the opportunity for information by attrition or error. And even if all the communication was perfect, sometimes patient status changes and it really creates a lot of risk to patients when they're transferred to the floor and then immediately require escalation. One thing I want to point out is in both the nursing and the physician APP studies, there was an overarching theme of professional dissatisfaction. And I think this results uh, or is a result of our providers want to provide the best care for our patients, yet the system in which they're working in does not allow them to do that. One nurse said, you feel incompetent and just totally flustered and you're not a good nurse. It's like, you're not getting off to a good start with these people who have already had a bad day. And then you're just like, I'm sorry, I'm waiting. It just makes me feel like such a baby. <laughs> I can't do anything. I have to wait for the doctor and it makes me feel not that great. And our physicians say, I've had these patients turn up. And they're septic on the floor. We've had outside hospital transfers that coded within hours. So I mean, these horror stories just burned all of us. 
and you just don't have the time. You just really have to get stuff going because they don't have anything. And then the worst case is when they don't have any records. So you can really feel that tension that our providers are experiencing when they take care of IHT patients. So again, just kind of going back to the um, process, high-level process view, looking at the area of IHT that I'm interested in, the themes that have come up in terms of care coordination where we can target include communication, how we exchange our information and the structures through which we communicate, how we define roles and responsibilities, and then something here about how do we create a system and a process that works not only for our providers but for our patients too. Future directions and currently looking at unanticipated adverse events um, such as transfer from floor to PC or IC when a patient arrives, um, stroke alert, rapid response events. Uh, and future studies like to look at family and per, uh, caregiver perspectives mm -hmm. as well as sending provider perspectives. And then I will be uh, leading uh, as a co-PI for, uh, or co-site PI <laughs> for a multi-center study uh, looking at the detail. And I'd just like to have a special thanks to all these people who have been uh, incredible mentors and collaborators and have helped me through uh, all of this and are continuing to help me. So thank you guys.